We all know the history of how the Gracie family created Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and made it the global powerhouse art that it is today. Or do we? Today we have a very special guest with us. His name is Robert Drysdale. He's a fourth degree Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt and MMA champion and instructor of his own academy, Drysdale Jiu Jitsu, located in Las Vegas. He's also a scholar of the art and that's the topic of today's video. Mr. Drysdale's book, Opening Closed Guard gives us a peek behind the scenes of his upcoming documentary that takes a second look at the history of BJJ as we know it. He's going to share his experience and research and perhaps give us a window into seeing the real origin of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You have extensive experience with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You've completed M uh, competed in MMA, and now you have written a book and are currently producing a documentary that questions the accepted narrative of the origin of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. For those of us who are not familiar with it, what is that current narrative? Um, it's not so much that I'm questioning the narrative. It's more that you know there was more to the story than we had originally heard. Like it was a very simplistic story, and I've always been somewhat skeptic of it you know um the, the the official narrative went you know maeda moved to berlin to para and mitsui maeda from the kodokan in japan and he brought his judo over and it was like a different judo it was the real jujitsu that the japanese were hiding from the people but carlos gracie's father did a lot of favors for maeda so maeda in order to repay those favors he would teach his uh, oldest son carlos gracie the real jiu-jitsu, right? The one that judo was hiding, right? And that narrative kind of stuck, you know, Carlos went on to train his brother Helio and Helio went to become a huge name in, in, in the, the development of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And um, yeah, and that became, you know, the rest of his history, you know, Horian Gracie brought over that that style of, you know, what they considered to be real jiu-jitsu, the one that judokas were hiding, which was in fact, you know, just judo there's that's what they were doing they just called it jiu-jitsu but it wasn't jiu-jitsu and uh and the narrative stuck you know and it wasn't until recently while we uh, the brazilian national library digitized the files um you know they're all their newspapers from the early in the 20th century that we can actually go back and understand these characters better and it was no longer oral tradition that was coming down through one single source which was carlos gracie everything we knew about that period had come to us through carlos gracie no one else which is a very suspicious testimony, not to question him, but you know, if you were to tell your own story, it would probably be a very positive one of yourself, a very unlikely that you would tell us a complete story that gave a honest and you know complete picture of your life. You know, people tend to self-glorify. That's that's almost like an instinct to do that, right? So the job of the historian is to try to like dig through all that and find out. What is it that this guy didn't tell us? What what part of what he told us was true and what part of it was not true? And, you know, even though newspapers are not, you know, they have their limitations as well, they're definitely better than oral tradition because oral tradition suffers from bias, first of all. A greater bias than a journalist who doesn't train jiu-jitsu would, for example. Um, but also because testimonies change over time. You know, like we learned this when we were interviewing some of these grandmasters and you can see like narratives changing over the years. They say one thing 30 years ago, 20 years, something else, 10 years ago, something else. And now they're saying something else. It's like, well, what happened? The facts didn't change, like, but their narrative changes with time. But we learned that and it was, uh, uh, it was quite the experience, but the, the narrative was, was very incomplete. And, and, you know, we felt that it was time to do something about it. So what led you to the question the origin to begin with? I thought it was too simple. There's, you know, I don't, I'm not a professional historian per se, but I, I, I know enough about history and I've been reading history books my whole life. Mm. Like, it's one thing that's consistent is that people are never angels. They're never demons. It's never, it's never this or that. There's always nuance. There's always more to it. And there's always like different perspectives. And, you know, you're going to get 10 people witnessing the same event. And if you have asked them immediately after report what they saw, you're going to get 10 different testimonies, sometimes completely different from one another. So anyone who knows, you know, is used to reading history knows these things. So when I heard that, like Maeda taught Carlos, who taught Helio, and he invented lever, 
and the Japanese were hiding real jujitsu through judo. I'm like, none of that makes any sense. Like, it's just not adding up. Like, you know enough about human behavior and how people are and how history is. And you go, no, I don't think that's what happened. So you start digging and like, it turned out that, you know, the instincts were right. And there was some work that was done, you know, like there's nothing really in terms of historical research. There's not much that we brought to the table, a little bit here and there. But I think that we mainly brought to light what was, you know, what wasn't there and people didn't know about. So how do you decide where to start your research to begin with? You said there was some work there. How did you pick that starting point? Um, I, I Googled it. I started looking for books on the history of jiu-jitsu and almost everything went back to Carlos Gracie. It was like a website, you know, or like Wikipedia, which is all meaningless. You know, YouTube video, Wikipedia, websites, it's, it's all meaningless. Like, you know, enough about history, you're gonna go like, where are my primary sources? Where are my historians? Where are the professionals that know how to do research, right? And I basically narrowed down to like three people. Um, two of them were Brazilian, uh, Josué Ficairos. He wrote a PhD dissertation on the history of Jiu Jitsu in Brazil. And uh, even though he wrote it in English, he wrote it for, I think it was like York University in Canada. But uh, uh, he's Brazilian, you know, he comes from Judo and he wrote a, wrote a very good PhD dissertation. It's online, it's available, it's free. And um, I loved it. And there's this other Brazilian guy who writes in Portuguese, who's not a professional historian, he's not an academic but he's an enthusiast and he did a lot of digging and there's a lot of cool things that he had in his books. And his name is Marcial Serrano. But perhaps the book that most impacted our research or this documentary was Shocky by Roberto Pedreira, who is um, an American academic who, you know, has done some digging, a lot of digging, in fact, in the history of martial arts in Japan and Brazil. Very professional, very thorough, very reasonable in his analysis, you know, very dry read. It's not a doesn't read like a novel, but his books are a huge influence. And, and I I saw what, what, what was being done there and I realized that that needed to be put into a film format. So that sort of led us to like, okay, so what can we do to put this money together, put this documentary together? And yeah, it's, I mean, I, it's, it's been a great journey, but um, there's still a lot to know. There's still a lot that we don't know. And it's not, people want to like a one fixed narrative, right? They want to know something so they can memorize it. And now like, I got it, I memorized it. But really, you know, the people that are interested in understanding the present, understanding, have an idea of what the future is going to be like, they have to have a good understanding of how the past has worked. And the past is full of nuance. It's full of perspectives. It's full of, there is such thing as objective reality, but there's also such thing as there are different inputs, different ways of looking at that same historical object, right? So really learn how to think history. And I think that's what's, um, that's what's missing a lot of people. I mean, most people don't care, which is funny, but What's so shocking to me is that the people who are making decisions about the future of jiu-jitsu don't know a thing about its history or history in general. So to me, that's always like an alarm because anyone that should be like in the forefront of guiding the sport ought to understand where it comes from very well. But that's completely missed by most people. I think, no, this guy, he's good at jiu-jitsu, he's good at arm bars, that's good enough. That's all we need to know. And to me, that's always like, oh man, that's not... That's not a good, uh, um, I mean, it's just not a good criteria. It's one thing they know how to fight. It's something else to be a good planner for the future of the sport, right? So all these things are going on. And I think that the book and uh, the documentary, they come in to maybe add something to this, you know, and add something to the overall art of jiu-jitsu and where, it's come, where it came from and perhaps point to a direction where it should be going. So you say there's, there's a lot of misconceptions that people have about BJJ and its history in general. That's pretty much all of it. I mean, there's very few things that people can say accurately. You know, I'll give you an example. Like Mitsui Maeda is in the, is a picture of Mitsui Maeda is in almost every gym in, in the world, right? In Jiu Jitsu. Maeda is the most exaggerated character in this whole story. Like I ask people, what did Maeda do? And they can't like, oh, he taught Carlos. How did, where'd you get that from? Oh, from Carlos Gracie. That's not evidence. <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, you can ask me something, Rob, like who killed JFK? And I can go, it was you. I mean, is that, you know, I mean, you can see anything you want. And, but like people get stuck with these things because it's been repeated so time. And I don't even try to convince people. Like, look, the facts are here. You can understand them, read them, learn them or not. I've done my part. Like, I'm not going to be on a mission to try to convince people to understand reality and history because uh, most people just don't don't care. They're perfectly happy just going about it and living, like putting a picture of Maeda. Like, might as well put a picture of 
I don't know, some other guy there, like some baseball player. It's like, what did my head actually do? And, I, and, and when you take him as away from, I mean, because we have better, we have better uh, candidates to be, to have been uh, Carlos Grace's teacher. We have much better candidates, but they're not famous because Carlos didn't make them famous, right? So there's. So your 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 book and your documentary goes into some of these other candidates that kind of uh, um, bring to light what they have contributed. Absolutely. So you know we we bring like, one of them. You know was a student. In fact, was Maida's best student. His name is Jacinto Ferro, and Jacinto Ferro was a very known athlete. He was a an accomplished athlete in like a number of different you know not just fighting but other sports. In fact, he was famous there before Maida had even come to uh, uh, to Brazil, right? And he became good friends with Maeda, and he, he, I mean, if anyone, it's, he is, whatever evidence we have of Carlos even training in that period, points to him being a student of Jacinto Ferro, not Maeda, right? So if you're going to put a picture of someone up, there should be a picture of Jacinto Ferro, you know? The other one, Jigoro Kano never taught Maeda, that's the other one. Everyone thinks that Jigoro Kano was Maeda's teacher, and he wasn't, we know he wasn't. But like people, it's completely missed because just people make these associations off like they think it is. It sounds like it should be. Someone else said it said it was, so it must be true. You know, there's not a lot of like skepticism and criticism. It's more like a like article of like believe whatever people are saying. And if a lot of people believe something, it must be true. So that was um, that's the other one. The, the, the better candidate, really. I mean, if you really need to create a link between what we now call Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Japan, it's Gio Omori. Most people have even heard of. He's a much stronger candidate than Maeda is. You know, there's much better evidence for Gio Mori to have him talk Carlos de Maeda. You know, but people, you know, they don't want to hear it. You know, but Gio Mori, if if you really had to create a link between the Kotokan and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that would be Gio Mori. You know, and and if if not other Brazilians too, though, not the peers, was Hayes is a great candidate to have him talk Carlos because both times he interacts with Carlos in Jiu Jitsu. He has interacted with Carlos Gracie as a superior, as someone who is above him in the hierarchy. So that's very instructive. Like, why why is Carlos taking a back seat and letting this guy take the forefront, right, when they're interacting on the mats? Clearly, this guy held some sort of uh, ascendancy over Carlos, right? So he's another strong candidate, but it is the weakest candidate. But everyone's, like, you know, going along with the narrative. And there, there's nothing connecting the two other than Jacinto Fejo. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing else. So to this day, you've put in considerable effort into this documentary with extensive research, travel, and interviewing relative players. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced on this project? Uh, I think my, my naivety, being so naive, and, um, you know, um, I think I wish I understood the history better before I set out to do this. I should have spent more time reading and thinking about it before I set out to produce this. Um, the fact that my my uh, documentary team does not have not come come through with their promises and agreements, and they have like deadlines, and they will never meet the deadlines, and and that's to do with me being so naive and patient and understanding, and you know that quote, "Nice guy has finished last." It's true, you know. Like sometimes you just got to put the hammer down and be the boss and be the leader and like stick to agreements and help hold people accountable to their word and promises. And, you're always like, oh, the guy is having a hard time in this financially. There's something going on in his life. He's having a baby. He's moving. Always patient. Always patient. Always patient. But people don't. They take that for granted. Like a lot of times, they like they're just yeah. My team just didn't come through like they promised. So like, it's been a bit of an issue. But other than that, um, you know, it's been the filming was a pleasure. Like putting it together, reading, writing the book, all of it. You know, being able to better understand the origins of jujitsu. That's been great. Like that, I have nothing to, um, I have no regrets there, no. Um, but the history itself, I think based on what we know, based on the evidence available, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, the best history book out there on this is Shockey by Roberto Pedrera. I don't think it's my book per se, but it's a very heavy and dry read. So people that want to read like a watered down interpretation that, I think, you know, my, my book does a good job of that. You know, it's, it's a pretty much, much, some would say even, I mean, it's funny because my book got called pro Gracie and it got called anti Gracie. So, which tells me I'm like somewhere on the right track, I think. Um, but in, in some ways I, I think that some things I've done wrong 
in, in terms of right. I would have been slightly different. And I plan on correcting the second edition. So one of them was, this is interesting, like about a few months ago, Raleigh Gracie, Horion's son, he called me out of the blue. Like, hey, I heard you wrote a book on the history of Jiu Jitsu. I'm like, yeah, can you send me a copy? I'm like, sure. So I sent him a copy. A couple months later, he gets back to me and he goes, I liked your book. I, th I thought you were very fair, except that you were not very fair with my dad, with Horion. And I go, you know what? You're right. That was the first criticism I heard to call about my book that went like, you know what? That was spot on. I was not fair with Orion. And I, I changed my mind after I read another book called uh, Worth Defending. It was like basically a, an autobiography of Richard Breslow, which was Orion Grace's first student in California. It's interesting. Very first student, right? 1981, whatever it was. And so he talks about like Orion handing out flyers in parking lots, trying to convince people who thought Bruce Lee was the greatest fighter in history to go into a garage to roll around with Brazilians and geese pretty difficult proposition in the 1980s right but this guy was doing that so richard was like observing all this 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 growth of jiu-jitsu that way because of horion and his efforts and after reading all that and horion thinking the ufc and putting the ufc together he kind of didn't get enough credit for it when you think about it i think that might have to do with his personality like he has a very uh, i don't know i think he, he he wanted to get the credit and he wanted it so bad that I think he didn't deal well with you know, how, how um, as the sport grew, he could have dealt with things better perhaps, but Horton is a very undervalued character. There's no doubt about it. I plan on fixing that in the second edition. Also giving Gio Mori more credit. I think that I didn't give Gio Mori his due credit in terms of arguably being the, you know, I mean, if you really need to create a founding father for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and a link between Japan, Gio Mori is, is the better candidate. Now, not Maeda. Maeda, to me, it's a mystery why he's such a... I ever put Maeda on a pedestal, like, what did he actually do? No one can answer that question. Like, they say, oh, Carl, 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 where? Show me. Where did you get that from? They can't show you anything because they don't have it. Interesting. And it's interesting that you brought up the book because writing the book about the making of a documentary during the making of the documentary and then releasing the book first is a little bit unorthodox. Um, yeah. Coming from a video production background myself, um, I personally enjoyed reading not only about the research you put in, but the material you were uncovering, but also the production challenges you were facing as well. So what actually prompted you to write and release this book? Well, we had a deadline to release the documentary September 2020, right? We originally, when the pandemic came out, we're like, oh, we're going to release it during the pandemic. It's perfect time. There are no tournaments. People are going to want to. So let's sink our teeth in. So I was a promise that it would be done in the summer of 2020. That was the promise. And then the summer got extended to the last day of summer, very last day of summer, right? Trying to extend that. And so meanwhile, while they're, I'm thinking they're finishing the film, I'm going to write a book. I wrote a whole book in the, during a pandemic and they were still weren't done with something that had been working on for almost three years, right? And then uh, in 2020, September 2020, of course, they weren't done. And, but my book was done. So I'm like, well, I got a book here. I don't have a film. Well, Let's change a few words here on the on the on the conclusion, explaining why the film is not ready because it's not my fault, and let's just go with it. Like I'm going to release the book, and the book is going to be out, and at least uh, the interviews are out, and the people get a little background in the history of jiu-jitsu. And honestly, I thought that the book, uh, I, like I'll be lucky if I sell like two, three hundred copies over the course of the book's life, and I think we sold something like five hundred copies in two days. You know, so it was, it was, the book has been far more successful than I expected it to be. We were ranked number one on Amazon for uh, Brazilian history. Number one on Amazon. We were ranked number three on Amazon for martial arts. We were behind Art of War and Bruce Lee's biography. So we were number three on Amazon for a minute there. So I was like, I couldn't even believe it. Like this is astounding. I mean, I, I expected maybe sell 300 copies and we sold 500 in like two days. So. You take great care to, uh, in the way you address the Gracie family. Like you, you keep this level of objectivity um, about them and you try to keep their place in history. What is their place in history and how did you go about maintaining that objectivity? I think you, you, you should, people get caught up with this, like I call it the, bi I had a binary, I use that word all the time, right? You're anti-Gracie or pro-Gracie. Like it's, it comes from, maybe from politics, maybe it comes from religion, good and evil. Like it's just, there's no nuance, there's no gray. And when it comes to people, it's all gray. There's no black and white. Who, who, who's a liar? Who, I could, how can you say someone is a liar 
or that someone is honest. You can't even say these things because everyone is honest sometimes and sometimes we're dishonest. Everyone sometimes lies and sometimes we tell the truth. There's no such thing that a person only tells the truth or only lies, you know, but we get caught up in these issues of language and, and we got up this, this mindset. It's like, it's this or that. And I've always made an effort to get rid of that. Like, I sh you shouldn't think that way. Like, get rid of those boundaries. Like, what is actually happening? Interpret the information head on, straight down the middle, free of, you know, uh, ideological constraints, free of, you know, emotional biases. What is the information? What are the facts? What did this person actually do objectively? Go, right? And then when you look at things objectively and you get rid of all that, you start seeing things a little bit clearer and you're going to go, oh, wait a second, what did Carlos Gracie actually do? And you see that he was extremely important, but it was primarily because he was so good at marketing. Like Carlos, like for example, I, I said this in, in, a, in an interview and like a lot of judokas got mad because the first judo guys love me, right? Because I'm basically saying that we don't do Brazilian jiu-jitsu, we do Brazilian judo, which is true. There's no such thing as Brazilian jiu-jitsu, we call it that. But we do Brazilian judo, that's what we do. So they love me. And then I said something like the extent of like, Jigoro Kano's genius had nothing to do with fighting. Jigoro Kano's genius was political. Oh no, they didn't like me because he was supposed to be this incredible fighter, but he wasn't, he never fought. Not that we know of. He wasn't a great fighter. I mean, I'm not even sure he was a great coach either because he was always busy, worried, thinking about like the, you know, how do you struggle, which is an extremely important job. You needed that guy. But his genius was political more than in the realm of fighting. You know, that's that's where he comes in. And Carlos's real genius was marketing. Carlos is the kind of guy that if he were alive today, you know, he'd be managing Jake Paul. He'd have five million followers on Twitter. Like that's that was Carlos. He was brilliant. He, he would have been an influencer today. That was the kind of guy he was, the kind of constantly trying to get his name on the press. Me, me, me. Like it's, it's like he was that guy, right? And he was extremely good at it. He was very good at promoting his brothers. But the truth of the matter, he had one fight, one professional fight, and he lost. So he's not, he was never, his fighting was never a strong suit, you know? And, but his brothers were better. George Gracie was, I mean, George Gracie was the first hero of the family. And the whole, and the family itself kind of neglected him. You know, it's just something I always remind people of when they want to tell me that the documentary, the, the book is like anti gracie I'm like, well, I think I've done more to bring back George Gracie's memory to life than any other person other than the historians I mentioned. You know, like I think I've done quite the effort. I've mentioned his name constantly in interviews just to give the guys due credit. He's arguably the founding father of MMA, which is really volatile. There's no such thing as MMA. The word of MMA is like, it's, a, it's an invention of the American crowd in recent years. The correct terminology is volatile. That's what it's called. And George Grace is arguably one of its founding fathers. If not, it's founding father. The first volatile fight arguably was George Grace versus Chico Soledad. No one remembers that, but that's it's an important piece of history right there, right, for MMA fans too. Uh, and then what did Helio do? Did, would Helio, was, was Helio's genius fighting? I don't think it was. I don't think his genius had anything to do with fighting. I don't think he was bad. But I don't think he was nearly as good as people made him sound. They made him sound like he invented all these things. I'm like, what did he actually invent? Like, what are, what in technical terms, what is it that he's doing that's not in every judo Niwaza book? There's nothing there, right? But he was important. Like, why was he important? Because judo made mistakes in terms of neglecting the ground. Now, why they did that, now that's a different discussion. We can, like, why for a variety of reasons, right? But, the reality is, you know, judo was, in order to become accepted by the Ministry of Education, they became, they lost a lot of the martial aspects of judo, like the combat, the fighting. And, you know, a lot of that was kept alive by Brazilians. They had a more martial approach to, to, to the judo, right? They didn't, they didn't call it judo because they couldn't call it judo because they wanted to create something separate. Issues of for reasons of vanity and, and you know, narcissism or whatever the case, but they wanted to create something separate from judo. And they did that. And Helio's personality to me was one of the most important ingredients of this whole story, because you have to remember what was judo in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. It's a steamroller of a martial art. That's what everyone wants to practice. He has government support. It has support from the private sector. It's in the Olympics, right? So all these things are happening in the 1970s. And, um, and they're still 50, 60, 70. So what, what's jujitsu? Not even in Brazil, people didn't care. Like no one cared about what the races were doing. But Kilio was that figure that kind of kept it together. And I think a lot of it had to do with his personality. He was like a very strong, stubborn leader. And I think what we now call Brazilian jiu-jitsu needed someone like him. And I think that was his big contribution to jiu-jitsu. Nothing to do with technique or creating, like crafting great students. I mean, 
from what we know about him, like I, I'm not even convinced he was a great coach either. I mean, I have my doubts. I don't. It's. I think Carlson was the man. You want to talk about fighting? What about fighting? Make people tap, take them down, fight, beat them up, any challenge, anytime, anywhere. I mean, I think George Gracie deserves a higher place than Helio, if anything, as in terms of fighting, at least. He fought tougher opponents. He fought more. Didn't pick and choose rule sets. Didn't pick and choose gi, short gi, no sleeve, long sleeve. Fight anyone, anytime, anywhere. And then you have Carlson. Carlson's the man. When it comes to fighting, Carlson was the man. When it comes to coaching, Carlson was the man. And then you get holes, Gracie. Very important for what we now call sportive jiu-jitsu or competitive jiu-jitsu. He was that guy that had that vision to, you know, him and Carlson, those two. So in terms of like, you know, the the the, the things that we value the most about in terms of technique or right? technical development, I think Carl's, Carlson and Holes were far more important than Helio. Helio was important in terms of keeping it together at a time where judo was huge. And for the sport that we now call Brazilian jiu-jitsu to exist, it needed someone to help it survive and not be absorbed by judo because i mean think about it like you know there's not a lot of there, there, there are no styles that blew up you know the way brazilian jiu-jitsu did brazilian, brazilian jiu-jitsu blew up because it was less technical it was more the fact that they created it they kept alive a martial culture a martial aspect of judo and and i think that for that survival for that to exist today two things are key and we don't like these things, but they're very important. One was marketing, right? And the other one was like that strong personality Helio had. That's where Carlson and Helio come in, you know? But in terms of fighting, like, I, I don't think Carlson and fighting and teaching, I think that Carlson is probably more deserving than his uncle Helio, for example. You know, if you really want to get down to the guy that, this was the guy that, you know, made jiu-jitsu applicable for fighting. You know, that was, that was Carlson more than anyone else in the family. What has been the greatest pushback that you've received from this project so far? I did not get as much flack from the Gracie camp as I thought I would. I was ready to pick a fight if I had to. Um, not what I why I wanted to do this, you know, but I think that you know facts matter, and if that if they upset people, if I say something that's true and you don't like it, the truth doesn't have a problem. You have a problem, right? That's to me, that's obvious. But some people, oh, you offended me, so you said something that's not okay, and I'm upset and I'm offended. And you hurt my feelings, so you shouldn't say it. I'm like, well, the truth does not care about how you feel. Like you have these things, and and so I was expecting a lot of, and a lot of people have this emotional attachment to that narrative, right? Interestingly, most of them are not even Gracies; they're just students of the Gracies. Like they're more Gracies than the Gracies themselves. A lot of the Gracies, like even Riley's, like, no, I liked your book. I thought you were fair. I think Hensel Gracie posted, reposted something on his page about an interview I gave once, talking about his father. So there's been actually, you know, the guys from IJJF, like Carlos Gracie Jr., like he was congratulating me when I saw him, when he saw me. Congratulations on all the success of your book, you know. That's that's Carlos Gracie Jr., like the president of IBJJF, founder of Gracie Baja. So I actually got a lot more support from these guys than than I. It was like almost like it was like 90% positive. Maybe maybe even more than that. And then every now and then you get people that either didn't read the book or don't know how to read it. I remember one guy wrote me on my Instagram, you're a liar, you're a scumbag. How dare you tell the denigrate the Gracie family? You should have interviewed Hobson Gracie and João Alberto Barreto. And he, he goes on this rant talking about you should have interviewed Hobson. Like, like, I should have interviewed. I did interview Hobson. What are you talking about? I did interview João Alberto Barreto. And then I realized this guy never read the book. <laughs> He's like, he goes on this rant about how awful my book was, but he never read it. So I, I messaged him did you read the book? And he goes, no, and I'm not going to read it because it's full of lies and blah. And that's what you're dealing with. I'm like, why am I even responding to this idiot? And then the other one was, the other common criticism that I can't take seriously was, oh, I failed in my mission to take credit from the graces. Like, who said that was my mission to begin with? You created that mission in your head. I never said that. But they go along with it because if they keep repeating, because once again, they're stuck with that binary view. If this guy is saying something and disagrees with the official narrative, clearly he hates the crazy family, right? That's their simplistic, easy, simple mind going on going, why on earth am I even speaking to these people, right? But I'm patient. I'm trying to like explain. And at some point I kind of gave up, right? At some point, like people are using arguments that I make in the book, right? To defend the Gracie family or give credit to them. They use it against me, acting as if I had not had used that same argument in the book. So to me, you either didn't read it or you're being dishonest or you don't know how to read one of the three. 
right? So th that was, but that's the minority. I'm giving you guys, I'm giving you like the exceptions. Like the vast majority of feedback was very positive. What was the most unexpected thing you discovered during your research or during production? I think how underplayed men like George, Gio Mori, and Carlson were, those three. How undervalued, how much more important they are to this story. And how Carlos, Maeda, Carlos, and Helio got all the credit, those three. And guys like Gio Mori, George Gracie, and uh, Carlson Gracie kind of got like, Carlson got, the only reason Carlson Gracie is remembered, by the way, is because he left an enormous legacy of students. Other than that, his name would have been buried, just like George Gracie, just like Gio Mori. Because they were not on board with Carlos and Helio anymore especially Helio and Carlson didn't get along were during the second half of their lives, right? So Carlson would have been erased. He wasn't erased because of his students, kept his memory alive. And because he created like, you know, the biggest MMA camps in history, a lot of guys came out of his camp. So that's why he's remembered. But th these guys are very undervalued. That was, came somewhat of a shock to me. You know, even like members of the Gracie family were, have, were being buried, you know, for political reasons or the reasons of jealousy and family disputes and, but again, like if it's, you know, these things shouldn't matter. What should matter is what role do these guys play? You know, what did they actually do for the, our sport to exist? And yeah, I think these, these three, Gio Mori, George, and uh, Carlson Grace did not get their due credit. Now with the experience and insight that you have with BJJ and the martial arts, what are the most important aspects that you feel people should focus on? I think people are really, really hyper focused on learning trendy techniques and they become like the equivalent of like fashion victims. Like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's funny how this, how jujitsu works today. It's no longer guided by objective reality, right? There are no statistics in jujitsu, so we don't know, but it's more, it's, it's, if you see something, right. And you see it over and over and over, you take it for granted. That thing is happening all the time. But if you see something that is really cool, and it seems like that is perhaps aesthetically pleasing, right? Or it's being done by someone with large influence. That thing right there takes precedence over everything else, right? So to me, my criteria has always been, when it comes to training, you should never look at it, rather something is old and new. So I never cared about that discussion. I think it's an idiotic discussion between old school and new school. Rear naked choke is pretty old. You know, it doesn't mean it doesn't work, right? It's the number one submission. So like, what is old school then? Like what? And then people get in this idea that new is better than old or old is better than new. And the question I always ask is, does it work? Right. That's, that's the criteria. That's the measuring. That's the metric right there is does what I am teaching or learning work? Is it efficient, efficient, right? And what's the center? If it is efficient, what's the center? What are the most efficient techniques that we call Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? And then we're going to have the margins and it's fine to have margins, but we shouldn't be focusing on the margins. We should be focused on the center. Right. And that's what I've always tried to focus on for myself and my students. But the center is not fashionable. So they're focused on the margins, which you can do. But there's going to be a lot of deficiency that comes with that. Right. Uh, what other thing? I think that there's a lot of in terms of training methodology, Jiu Jitsu and MMA are very, very behind other sports. Like shockingly behind. And it's like almost like in MMA, there's no excuse in Jiu Jitsu. It's a family oriented model. You only give them like X amount of hours per day. You no, know, very few people are professionals, but in MMA, it's shocking how unprofessional they are. I want you to think of it. And they have money, guys with a lot of money. And they, they're basically complete amateurs when it comes to their training. I'm just watching, I'm going, I, I mean, yeah, you win. You're incredibly talented. You hit hard, you're a beast of an athlete. You got a good work ethic. But when it comes to methodology and preparation and the environment and the what makes, you know, like the way someone would run like an NBA team or the way someone would run an Olympic team. And then you go to MMA and you see how incredibly amateur they are. You know? uh, Jiu-Jitsu has a lot of that too. In terms of how it, uh, teams should be organized, it's, it's very, very uh, inadequate in my opinion. Um, I think in terms of psychological aspects of Jiu-Jitsu or like fighting in general, it's very, they're very undervalued. I think that how we teach Jiu-Jitsu is incorrect. I think we teach with an eye on keeping the student happy versus actually teaching them what they need because what they want and what they need is not always the same thing. And the coach should be in a position to do that. But the coach is not the boss. You think the coach is the boss. Who's the real boss in the gym? The paint student. 
you understand there's a conflict of dynamics there where like the hierarchies aren't really set. Who's the boss? And that's a huge problem because if a coach is modeling his training around making his student happy, well, then he can't do what's best for his student because what the student wants and what the student needs are rarely the same thing. This you know, so that's because, yeah, because this is interesting that you're saying this because BJJ and MMA are often held as the gold standard for competitive martial arts, and people always compare everything else to MMA. So, this is actually a very interesting perspective. Oh, they're incredibly amateur. I mean, I, I can't speak for karate and taekwondo, like, I don't know. Okay, uh, now I know that phrase on collegiate wrestling or like an Olympic training center judo, they have a better dynamic because there is authority and it's top down. Coach is the boss. In MMA, you know who the boss is? The wife. The wife. Oh, yeah. The wife tells the, co the, the fighter who the fighter is going to hold pads with. You know why? Because she wants to buy a new couch. She wants a new car. So she's got to save money. And if this guy's holding pads for free, that's the best coach. Because the guy will hold pads for free because he wants to get on TV and get free Reebok gear or Venom gear. You, you see what's happening here? Like, you get all these influence. They're like, wait a second. These things should not be factors in this discussion, but they're huge factors. Manager, bossing around, coach, the fighter has like eight different coaches, all saying eight different things. Sometimes the coaches don't even meet until fight day, okay? The fighter is running camp. The fighter runs the camp, not the coach. The coach follows the orders. You know why? Because the fighter pays the coach. So who's the boss? Commercialism. Yeah, so it's basically commercialism, commercialism is just saturating it. It's the same thing in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. If the parents are complaining about something, you have to change the program because if you leave 20 kids, you can't pay rent. So the, 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 the instructor, the coach, is unable to do his job due to this dynamic. So he has to accommodate, change, and assimilate to the wishes of the person that he should be training. So commercialism, yes, it throws a monkey wrench in the conversation. This is why collegiate wrestling is better in that regard, or like Olympic training centers, or even professional sports, like the NFL. The idea that the, the player is going to tell the coach how to run the show is laughable in those environments. Like, oh, bro, you're like, oh, the collegiate, again, collegiate wrestling, and the guy says, hey, my girlfriend is disagreeing with you, coach, on how you're running the program. I mean, the coach would probably shit his pants laughing, you know, like, <laughs> Get off my team then, you know. But if you're running a gym or if you're like a coach, maybe you can't. Like you are, you take a back seat. You're not in the, you're not in the driver's seat, put it like that. The, the Whoever, people in the fighter's personal life. Right? And it happens a lot. If you ask people in the MMA world and, and, they, and they listen to what I'm saying, they're going to agree with me. They're not going to say anything because they're like, this is how I get paid. I don't like it, but I like those checks that I get. So I, if I want to remain where I'm at, and keep my social status and not lose this position, right? If I want to remain where I'm standing and not, I have to what? Abide by the game. Got to play the game. And I think that, I think, I tried to change it. Like I've tried, it's, it's almost impossible because the culture, they look at you like you're crazy because you're swimming against the current because you're doing something different. Like I'm telling them, if you're fighting, you know, you should not be training with random coaches and random people. And they look at that, oh, you're trying to control me. It's like, listen, now go ahead. If you played for the Raiders, do you think the Patriots are going to let you watch them train? Absolutely not, right? Like that's unthinkable in professional sports. In MMA, it happens every day. And I'm not making this up. You get random people walking in, recording, and no one says a thing. I'm like, are you people stupid? I don't know how else to say this. I'm sorry, but like, and, but they allow it. And if you try, they have, they go to five different gyms and they're sparring with people they are going to be fighting next year or they're sparring with people who their friends in this gym are going to be sparring right and that all that is happening people get injured you know what they do they call their friend that's going to be fighting that guy they just saw the guy get injured in practice and they called him he blew his left knee i'm not making this up this is a, i'm not going to mention names but this is a real story of big names in MMA. the guy gets a phone call 15 minutes later telling him he just blew his left knee in practice and the guy kicks his left knee the whole fight wins the fight that way and this is happening all the time. And no, this is why Khabib is smart. Khabib is the best because he's smart, not just because he's good. They block it off when he goes UFC. I like, know one watches his practice. They don't let anyone train with him. They don't let anyone watch. Only their coaches and only their friends. Boom. They keep the system they had in Dagestan. Whatever works there is going to work here. They never changed it. Genius. I mean, it's not genius. It's obvious, you know, but it's unusual because very few 
teams are doing that. And the same thing happens in BJJ. Same thing. So I think in, in a lot of ways, it's they're, just because they're winning doesn't mean they're doing things right. You know, people get these things. Someone's going to have to win. I mean, you can have the worst methodology in the world everywhere. Someone's going to win. It doesn't mean they're doing it well, you know. So do you hope that this project um, impacts the future of, of the competitive MMA or BJJ as a whole? Uh, I don't think it will. I don't think I have any hopes. I think that it's out there for people to... I mean, the, 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 here's the thing. Here's the reality of this, man. How many people are reading history books to learn about American history or anything versus how many people are listening to podcasts, YouTube videos, and Wikipedia to learn? I mean, it's, it's screaming different. Like, you can write a paper on the Founding Fathers, right, full of sources. You can spend 10 years of your life write an astounding paper on Thomas Jefferson and you get four people to read it, right? That's the truth. And you make a dumb video where you're loud and you scream, and you say words like patriotism and freedom and treason, and you say something like that and everyone's like, yeah, it must be true, you know? And it's gonna get a million views. And that's the nature of thing. I, I don't think that, I think the more serious and better quality things are, the less inclined people are to read it. The more inconsistent, the more flawed, the more deceiving, the more dishonest, the more people are likely to applaud it. It's very strange, but it seems to be the dynamic when it comes to knowledge, right? We're all looking for knowledge in the wrong places. I, I mean, I had a student of mine, I, I wrote this in the book, but this is a true story. The guy was like, Rob, why do you like to read? Like he's quite, he's look like, like I'm crazy for reading. I'm like, I'm looking, why don't, just Google it. That's what he told me. He was, and then I got into an argument with him. He was trying to tell me, that you don't need to read books anymore because all you have to do is Google things. And this is coming from, not from an eight-year-old, this is coming from a 22-year-old or a tw early 20s or whatever it was. And I'm going, and he was serious too. Like he held his ground, like he thought I was nuts. And I'm like, this guy does, and I'm like, I I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna waste my breath. And it's like, you know, me writing the book, the fact that it sold the way it sold is almost like, it does give you a little bit of hope. Okay, so maybe it's not all bad. But I feel that the people who are reading and, you know, maybe enjoy the book are people from my generation and older. I don't think there's a lot of 22 year olds reading and appreciating. And maybe they'll change when they're older. I don't know. But I think that the tendency we're watching and there's a, that the internet has changed something in how people learn. And, you know, critical thinking, skepticism, these things, like even like basic understanding of how science works. These people don't have that because I think schooling system failed in teaching them that. There's been a failure there. So they breach adulthood and they're not really, they don't know how to process information. They just believe what they like to believe. So if they, they train with the Gracie, my book is shit. If their instructor happens to hate the Gracie, then my book is great. I think that's kind of like the criteria that people are using. You know, so because of that, I don't know if I can, you know, if there actually is going to be an impact for the documentary of the book. But in some ways, I think it's some things have changed in some good way. It's like when I first started this out of curiosity, I went on Wikipedia just to see what the articles read. Right. Like what, what, what was there? And it was like so incorrect. That was one of the things that pushed me to want to do this. Like, this is so wrong with people. That's because I know that's where people are getting their information from. So I want to see what people are seeing. I did the same thing about six months to a year ago, and it was very different. It had changed. So some of the names that I had mentioned today were on there. Gio Mori, Jacinto Ferro, you see, you're starting to hear about these names. So maybe there's going to be some change. I don't think that you could ever, you know, you, no one's going to take down those pictures of Carlos and Helio and Maeda. Not that that's what we were trying to do. Um, I think, but I think that, you know, if people better understand their history, I think Jiu-Jitsu has a better chance of, surviving in the future that's what i would really like you know it was more about what can we what can we learn about the past so we make the future better right that's what history is for as i see it but i think the way the culture in jiu-jitsu is going it's not going well i think it's going to go it's going the opposite direction it should be going it should be following what judo did there's a reason why judo was so successful it's been around for 140 years you know brazilian jiu-jitsu is going the opposite direction and i don't think there's cohesion there i don't think there's purpose there I think Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is going, it is guided by people who want to make money. And when you have that as your north, you're not, you're not really thinking long term. You're thinking about yourself. It's like thinking about me with Jiu Jitsu as a vehicle versus doing what is sacrificing my efforts for Jiu Jitsu. 
So you are the vehicle for jujitsu, right? In that way. But what's happening is jujitsu is the vehicle for me. You see the difference? So, and because we, we've created a culture, they call it American jujitsu. And at first I was like, American jujitsu is the dumbest thing ever. This is like resentment. This is, there's no other way to put this. These are people who couldn't win tournaments. And now they're trying to create another separate world because they can't stand the fact that Brazilians are winning. Like, let's leave nationalism aside, right? Like, forget about that for a second. Brazilians are dominant in grappling. They've always have been, right? Talk about innovation. Like, almost everything we know, right, came from jiu-jitsu in Brazil in the 90s and early 2000s, right? Like, that's the foundation of, of the, 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 the technical revolution, even though Japanese had done it first. What we know did not come from the, the Kosen Judo. It came from Judo, Kodokan Judo, you know, traditional, and then... Brazilians like really like blew it up in the 90s in terms of technical innovation, right? But now it's like, you know, three things are invented over in the United States. Like, oh, it's no longer Brazilian, now it's American. And at first I was like, this is, this is resentment. This is you guys not doing well in tournaments, right? And blaming Brazilians for it. Oh, I lost a match, Brazilian fault. Blame the Brazilians. Everything, I mean, Brazilians are this, Brazilians are that. Like, look at IBJJF, the most organized event in, in, in all of Jiu-Jitsu by far is IBJJF. They put on events with 7,000 people, you know, but some people don't like that. Why? Because they're making money. How dare these people already make money? So that creates, all, that's where this American jiu-jitsu comes from. That's where it comes from. But in some ways it has become American because it has so much, um, it's changed the culture so much. It's changed the guiding north of what we used to do was like, what is best for jiu-jitsu? Now it's going, how do I make money? Right. And that's been, that is the priority in this world. And Ticket sales. As long as we sell tickets, as long as we get followers and views, that's then we're winning. That's what success is. And the worst part is you have to listen to people telling that they'll bring in more eyes to the sport. Like, man, you're you're it's ludicrous to believe that. The people watching these shows are people that are well within the IBJJF circuit. And if they did, if and if you didn't exist, they'd still be competing and training because those people are already in jujitsu. Your grandma's not watching jujitsu. The people that are watching these shows, these events, these professional events are all within the IBJJF sphere. But they keep repeating that we're bringing eyes to jiu-jitsu by acting obnoxiously, by being disrespectful, by self-promotion. And then you're teaching all this to a younger generation. And you think the sport has longevity when you're teaching kids that? It doesn't. So I, I don't think jiu-jitsu has a future, man. I think it's a sinking ship in a lot of ways because they've created an awful culture and everyone's applauding it like it's a great idea. And I'm like, okay, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm no angel. But I, I know a thing or two about the history of martial arts. And I've seen this movie before. It's not the first time we've seen this. What is what, what is happening now? It has happened before. You know, and we know what happened. So here we are. You know, I, I think that, I mean, some of my attempt, my, I guess like the back of my, my mind, like idealistically, I wanted, you know, to do something for jujitsu that was meaningful and lasting. It's like helping, like kind of steer the sport in a better direction. But I don't think it's going to accomplish that. Maybe that was too ambitious. But it did make it clear to me that, as is right now, jiu-jitsu is going in a very strange direction. And I don't care how many tickets they sell at the next ADCC, ticket sales are not a good metric. I'm sorry. You can put Hasbullah fight Kim Kardashian in MMA, and you're going to sell more tickets than Khabib and McGregor. You say you can have celebrity. If Justin Bieber fought Tom Cruise, that would have sold more, more pay-per-views than any other MMA fight in history. But is that what we want in the sport? Like mud, mud fest, it's not mud. I mean, that's what I mean. You can you can put hot girls in a bikini, fight in MMA, or a topless. And how much? How many? How much is that going to sell? So ticket sales is not a good metric because it's short lived, short sighted. It has no longevity. There's no purpose. There's no direction, and that's kind of what's happening to jujitsu. But the sort of uh, culture of, of self promotion and and that they create, I don't I don't think that's good long term. You know, but. I, you know, the book is out, the history is out there. This, this moment we're living has been, it has existed before. It's not so, it's not identical, but it's it had a lot of similarities. And hopefully, you know, jujitsu sticks around. It continues to change lives and makes people's lives better. Because that's what its ultimate goal always has been. You know, it's improved. I know it's changed my life. It made me a better person, I think. You know, I think that's why we like it. It gives us a second family. And for that, we have to incorporate it with, keep it good culture, you know, not allow it to, become something negative and narcissistic. Well, if people walk away from this, this interview and in your book and all your efforts with just one message, what do you want that message to be? 
keep training, man. Keep training. Find a good place, you know, stay around good people. Um, remember that, you know, when you teach or when you're learning, you carry a responsibility to help others. You know, like, like sometimes, like, I, I see the cultural change I'm talking about. I'll give you an example. When I was a purple belt, if someone asked me to teach a white belt, I felt flattered that I had the opportunity to help someone. Like, oh, why well, you ask me? Wow, I must know something, right? I feel happy to help. But now the purple belts, I'm like, I'm not getting paid. Like, it's it's changed. Like, it's it's changed. So like, but like, be happy to help. Be happy to teach the white belts. You know, be happy. You should be you should be excited about that. If you put a smile on your face. You get to share this. You know, like, man, I get to teach this to someone else. It has done me good. Maybe it's going to do someone else good. And maybe that is, you know, it'll give you some, it'll be fulfilling in some way, right? Like, it, must, it feels good. Like, if you can do something, like, if you brought your mom and dad over to jiu-jitsu and your little brother that was, like, struggling with confidence, and now you see your little brother walking with his back straight and got his head up and looks you in the eye when he says hi, you know, he's no longer walking with his shoulders down. He's not so... That right there, man, to me, is the best jiu-jitsu has to offer, man. It really is. You know, I think that as long as we don't lose that, like everything else that happens is okay. Like that right there, we got to keep, you know. And, and I think that we should we should struggle and fight hard to make sure that that right there stays that way. Fantastic. Well, I just wanted to thank you so much um, for your efforts in this project, in this book. I found it fascinating to read. I highly recommend anyone watching this, definitely go pick up your copy. We'll have a link in the description below. But it, it really opened up my eyes to a lot because I, I kind of – you know, grew up with the same general narrative that you talked about, you know, the general understanding and reading this book, it was like, wow, there are so many more layers here that we didn't understand. And I just, I definitely encourage anyone who has not read this to read this book because there's a lot, a lot, like you actually have to read it a few times to get all the information that's in there. So I just want to thank oh. you for putting your effort and your time into making this project and bringing it to, you know, make it accessible to everyone. No, uh, and if, if guys, if those of you who are interested um, in like digging deeper, I'll, I'll recommend Shockey by Hobart Padilla, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And there's another series out called Craze, also by Hobart Padilla, 1, 2, and 3. Highly, highly, highly recommended if you want to understand the history of martial arts. Highly recommend, okay? There's like a fourth one coming out soon, but the first three are out. They're on Amazon. I cannot recommend these books more for people that are really into history. So. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you, man. See you next time. Now that's a lot of information to chew on, and I'm sure that the comment section is about to light on fire with a whole variety of opinions. Now, if you have any doubts or you want to learn more about what he found, then I highly recommend picking up his book. Now, this is not a sponsored video or a paid endorsement. I read this book as a personal curiosity, and I can honestly say it surprised me, and it presents some pretty credible discussions. I can't recommend it enough, so you can find a link to it in the description down below, and I cannot wait to see this documentary when it comes out. So a great big thank you to Mr. Drysdale for sharing your time with us and for the investment and effort into trying to preserve the legacy that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu deserves. And quite honestly, this is why we continue to do this channel, to learn even more about the martial arts, even if it goes against what we may have learned previously. Let us know what you think down in the comments below. Please keep it respectable, and thank you so much for watching.